Kevin is currently the Senior Manager of Coaching Development for U.S. Lacrosse. Uh, nationally recognized coach developer, over 20 years of experience, and I think it's amazing you've uh, actually taught somewhere over 5,000 coaches in that 10 years, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, uh, topic for today is how to develop strategy, lessons learned, and people's terms. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you for having me. So this is not as uh, in-depth as you would think. It's actually a very simple concept. Um, and I wanted to share before I get started, I wanted to really share the, the mission and the vision of our coach development program, which follows the alignment of U.S. lacrosse in general. But uh, this will come back to this topic on several occasions. Um, at the end of the day, and you'll see that what is highlighted is the focus on the kids. So our program is developed to allow the best possible experience of the development of the kids through their coaches. Um, and that when we teach our clinics, that's really our message to them is making sure that everything we do is aligned for the kids. Uh, our mission at the end of the day, and this is something that we're striving for, and again, the message to the FIL community as you build your program is, is to really focus on building best in class programs, resources, and more than anything, standards. Um, having something that people can rely on, knowing that that is the gold standard, okay? So uh, just a little line, I don't know if you've ever watched the, the movie Field of Dreams, but there is a great line whispered that if you build it, they will come. Um, we found in some of the data that you'll see is that um, over the course of the last 15 years, uh, the coaches are coming. They're starting to kind of leave their old ways. Uh, they're realizing that we, even as entrenched coaches, can still learn things. Um, so new old dogs can certainly learn some new tricks. Um, and that's really the theme that I want to follow. Um, more than anything, uh, the message that I really want to communicate is this. Um, if you're building your development program, especially around coaching, um, my wish for you is, again, it's people say, if I could go back and tell my, uh, myself something 20 years ago, what would I tell myself? And uh, from a programming side, for U.S. Lacrosse and the Coach Development Program, I think that message would be take the time and build for where you want the program to be. You know, think of as far out as you can some of the wildest things that you can think of um, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. What would it look like if we could ever do this? Uh, I think some of the, the challenges we faced uh, were based on we built what we had or we built on what we knew. Um, rather than really reaching forward and going, what don't we know yet? And how can we build it based on what we think is coming down the line? Okay, so how did we get here? Just a really quick timeline to, to shed some light on where we're going is back in 2004, uh, the Coach Development Program, U.S. Lacrosse, launched the first uh, online learning platform for coaches, our Fundamentals of Coaching Boys Lacrosse and our Fundamentals of Coaching Girls Lacrosse. Um, specifically of note, it was actually the first national governing body in the country to offer online learning to its coaches. Um, so it progressed through in 2005. Uh, our national training pool was, we had 19 coach, uh, coach developers covering the entire country. Um, and you'll see, I'll kind of fast forward here, where we are right now, we are at 192. So quite a, quite a big jump and, and I'll kind of fill in the gaps of how we got there and why we got to this point. Um, in 2007, we launched our, launched our first certification program for level one, in 2009, level two, and then 2013, level three. Um, currently, again, if we look at some of these uh, things that have developed over the last 15 years, uh, our online offerings, uh, obviously going from two to 500 plus, uh, 50,000 coaches have been trained or have accessed our online learning system. 28,000 plus coaches have been trained in person around the country. Uh, we launched our mobile coach app, which has 500 plus drills on it as well. Uh, and we, do, we run approximately 100, 125 clinics a year in person. So it's quite an undertaking with a staff of uh, myself, Gara Wazesko, uh, TJ, and Chris Mallory on our athlete development side, and uh, Daniel Whiteman, who is our instructional designer. Um, so 
some of the lessons learned. So all the all that data is really nice, okay? But what does it mean at the end? Uh, and and really, it comes down to the lessons that we've learned. So in the last five years, we have probably learned more than we have in our entire lifespan of being in, uh, a governing body. And I say that from a coach development standpoint, and I focus on, TJ already talked to you about the, did you call it the square mid? Did you, absolutely, okay. So we've kind of, we've, we've uh, denoted this as, instead of the pyramid, it's the square mid. But really, uh, the, over the last five years, the development of the athlete development model has really changed our focus on meeting our mission and meeting our vision. Okay, so the long-term athlete development model is really the key, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So the other lesson that we learned is really um, in taking a look at the things that we've done over the past 15 years from an education standpoint, um, pedagogy, the whole idea of working with youth, teaching um, through Bloom's taxonomy, understanding how kids learn, how young people develop um, their sense of being, how they understand their uh, comprehension of, of material and their their retention of knowledge. So we've taken all of this and we've built it in, not only in the, um, in the long-term athlete development model, but really into our coaching development. Uh, the other piece of this is about andragogy, about adult learning. And this is really the key. This was the key turning point for us in making our material really accessible to adult learning. Uh, a lot of it was built on how much can we get out? How much can we put in to our online learning and just get out to coaches? But what we really had to do was step back and, and think about what does that mean in terms of real life for adults? You know, people have jobs, they have families, they have you know, busy lives. So what can we do to make learning enjoyable, but really self-directed? Self you know, because the adult learner is really internally motivated. So we had to figure out how do we make the learning intrinsic um, and give them these experiences that will make them ready to learn and ready to receive the information that we want them to, to take away. Okay. Um, real quick, uh, are there opportunities for questions or? Questions at the end. Perfect. Okay. So, so the lessons that we've learned have really translated into the tables that have been turned. You know, what have we done? What have we, we finally have kind of stepped back and said, you know what? We've done some really great things. We were very proud of where we are, where we've been, um, but how do we get better? How do we take what we know and say to ourselves, if we could go back in time, how would we do this differently? How could we be more successful? And really it comes down to um, five key points. Okay, and I'll walk through each of these. Uh, specifically, but it's about aligning completely, uh, really tearing down what we have and building back up from scratch our material based around the athlete development model, reducing our clinic, uh, um, our live clinic timing, again, to, to be more in line with adult learning, really giving access to the host to be able to put the um, the desire, the onus back on local leagues and chapters to be able to take uh, take some of the ownership to, uh, of the learning process for their coaches, expansion of our training pool, and really a shift from the national model to a more regional and local model of learning and development. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, and there's a there's a long quote up there that uh, that you can certainly read, but this is a a quote from one of our uh, one of our senior trainers, who is a both a teacher and a longtime coach in Maine, but it was really how they were able, or how uh, Bill Clapp was able to incorporate all of the elements of uh, the ADM model into the clinics, um, and how to and how successful he felt with respect to imparting that knowledge to the coaches, um, and it really to be able to. Sorry, to be able to put that power in our trainers' hands, because they're they're really they represent us. They are uh, they are our lifeblood. They're our best marketing asset, and they're the ones who are working with some very tough customers who have kind of an old world mentality, um, but also the challenging uh, you know I don't want to say the millennials, but 
new coaches that are coming out of college who play a high level, who don't really understand the educational aspects, the research-based methods that we use. So um, he's been very really successful in pulling this together. So the second piece of our, of our redevelopment really for the programming was taking our seven hour clinic and reducing it down to three hours. So our third piece is the host portal uh, that we developed and, and our host resource site. So really what we've done in, in um, giving our local leagues and, and uh, chapters the ability to control some of the, um, the logistics has really given um, it, a little bit, it, it's their, their emo we've kind of stroked their emotional needs um, in the fact that they still need to communicate through us because as we train coaches, as they register, um, we need to be able to capture that, uh, that information so that we can make sure that their certifications and their training records are updated. But what this portal that, uh, that was developed internally at US Lacrosse allows a local host to do is set up their clinic basically in a shell that says, I have this particular date available. Um, there's, uh, I can see what trainers are available in my area. I can check on their availability. And I can basically build my clinic in, in this uh, little self-contained uh, bubble. And then if it works and they can get the, the coaches, that information gets transferred into our system through Dara Wazesco, who's our clinic manager. And then we will go ahead and if the trainers are available, we'll assign them through our Arbiter system. And then everything gets populated in here. And then what happens is the hosts can go into their resource page and they have access here, uh, all pre-developed materials. So the pre-clinic emails that they can send out to their clinic participants, uh, what the needs are coming up. They have certification requirements. Um, there's marketing information uh, contained within the resource site that allows them to send out emails to, um, to member coaches in their areas to let them know that a clinic is coming up. Um, so all of that information is really self-contained and allows these local hosts to, to have more control over the process. Okay. So the fourth piece as we're coming to the end of this is really about the accessibility of clinics. Um, being able to train coaches quickly, easily, nimbly to be able to react to, uh, to a host who says, you know what, I've got 12 coaches, I'm two weeks out from our season, I've got 12 new coaches, I need to get them trained, and we want them to be certified, what can we do? Um, in the past, if mo most of our coaches or coach developers were here located on the East Coast, so if we had somebody in Seattle who wanted to do this, trying to figure out if our trainers were available, what the cost associated with getting them out to a clinic site in Seattle, was it one day, was it two days, um, it was really taxing. So uh, we were tasked, Steve Standerson had tasked us to really um, scale the program in, um, in a smart way, but in a very quick way, a little bit quicker than we had liked, but it, it really worked out well. Sometimes you have to be pushed. And again, one of those things where, talking to my former self again from lessons learned, I would have said, what would it take to get to, um, the vision that we had is if you can picture a map of the United States um, and concentric circles touching the entire country, and those circles represented a two hour drive from where a particular trainer lived, we would love to be able to have a situation where we have trainers who could drive anywhere in the country within two hours and have a, have a clinic covered. Um, so that's kind of one of those visions and, and how do we get there or how, did, how are we getting to that point. Just in the last three years alone, um, you know, the 74 trainers that we had, and if you think back to the earlier slide, you know, starting with 19 trainers, to go from 19 trainers to 74, in a matter of seven to 10 years, and then jump from 74 trainers to 192 trainers in three years. It was a, it was a pretty fast, uh, it, was a, it was a fast process, um, not without its bumps, uh, because the training process is not as simple as, you know, you love lacrosse, you've been a coach for 20 years, you want to be a trainer, 
come join us and go train. Uh, you know, the integrity of the program, I think, has to be maintained. And, uh, and one of the processes in, in maintaining that integrity is um, getting the, the trainer applications in, vetting the trainers through, um, so through the, the network of lacrosse coaches and administrators that we know, um, but also going through, um, I wouldn't say an extensive training process, but um, a pretty detailed training program, um, some initial training. Uh, we put them through a uh, two, two training practicum courses where they actually have to go out with a mentor trainer and teach and get evaluated. Um, then they're teaching essentially for an entire season before they can actually go out on their own. Um, because again, they represent U.S. Lacrosse. They are, they are actually, the trainers with U.S. Lacrosse are actually employees uh, based on a law that, uh, that came down several years ago. So, uh, you know, jokingly, I have more employees than Steve Stanerson does. So, um, but they're great people, they're wonderful, uh, they represent us well. Um, but you can see just from a standpoint of how important it is to scale a program, you know, the average miles traveled for, uh, for a trainer in 2015 was 910, and to be able to cut that by a third, um, just think about the cost savings. And as we go forward, it allows us, again, to do more and to keep costs down. And at some point, to, you know, if we get to a pure local model, the hope is that our cost model can come down even more for the coaches. Okay. So the final piece, this is just kind of a heat map of where we were in 2015 to where we are in 2018, just from a standpoint. The gray dots are the, um, the, the clinics that we've run. The green is kind of the overlap of the trainers. So you can see we're still, the majority of our clinics are, are east of the Mississippi. Um, but there are some really growth areas um, in these other, um, these other spots, the, the Midwest, Seattle is growing. But what we're doing is we're looking at this map and saying, okay, what is next? Not what's happening right now, but what are the next hotspots? And trying to figure out um, what data is out there that we can mine to figure out where the next uh, growth areas are going to be and what we can do to start to bring on local trainers in those areas. Uh, the double-edged sword there is that we want people to come on and embed in specific areas, but they may not have trainings right away. And we don't want to, to bring people on and get them excited and then not have them have anything to teach. Um, so it's that fine balance of you know, seeing what's ahead of us, but getting there uh, and not getting people uh, you know, ready to do something that we're not ready for them to do. Okay. The last piece of this puzzle is really our shift to regional planning. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of, of kind of what it looks like internally of how many clinics that we do. And, and essentially the way we build our model now is we look at our, uh, we work with our regional managers <clears throat> and we ask them, this is all part of our budgeting process, but we work with our regional managers and say, how many clinics did you do last year? How many clinics do you think you'll do this year based on what patterns of growth you might be seeing or what you've seen over the last three to five years. So we're trying to, again, be real smart about where we, we put our, our focus, where we put the dollars, um, because those dollars also represent where we as an education and training team put our resources. So for instance, if in, uh, let's look here. So the Pacific Southwest, so it's not a, well, let's take the Pacific Northwest as a difference. So um, 42 clinics budgeted for that particular area. So if we go back a year, two years, that number was probably cut in at least by a third, if not two thirds. I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head. But, um, but Lynn Porterfield, who is our, our regional manager in that area, looked at the trends, looked at the growth in those areas in the youth leagues, looked at what was happening at the high school club level, and we made a concerted effort to, 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 put, to start putting resources in that area, to bring on more trainers in that area, and really to get ready for that growth. So you know, we're ready to handle that. So obviously when we look at this map, 
or this, this kind of budget sheet, some of the things that pop out are, you know, the Pacific Southwest and the Southwest and Central areas are, are on the low end of our scale right now. So what we're doing now is we're looking at those areas and saying, is that traditional? Has that, has that trend stayed there? Or is there something that's happening that might push that number up? Because what we don't want to do is be surprised. So again, from a, from a looking backward to look forward standpoint, what we're doing as we build our strategic plan for the next few years is to figure out how do we get ready for those areas in the event that they grow like that. So we never want to be surprised, okay? So at the end of the day, where do we go from here? Okay, um, just a little snapshot of, uh, of one of our goals from our strategic plan. And I wanted to share this with you because at the end of the day, we talk about improving quality and quantity of coaches. Well, quantity is pretty easy to, to measure, right? We know how many coaches have come through our program. We know how many will come through next year because we can see that. Quality is hard. Quality is hard because uh, a coach can say all the right things in a training class and they can do all the right things while people are, are at practice, but when the competition hits, you know, how do they react? And the hard part is, you know, we feel proud with, about our certification programs, um, but a level three certified coach could be the worst coach in the world. Coach in the world. So, uh, you know, funny story is I was driving with my son when he was, I guess he was 16 or 17 when he was first driving. And, and uh, I said, well, Ethan, you know, I've had my driver's license for 30 years and you've had yours for a year. He goes, well, dad, that just means you've been doing stupid longer. So, <laughs> and I didn't have a comeback for that one, but it's about, you know, the coaches have to take ownership, obviously, of their learning experience. So we feel like if we give them the best opportunities and the most opportunities, um, things that other people, one of our trainers says it very, very aptly. He says uh, to coaches, you know, go to every clinic that you can, go to every X's and O's and get every drill that you can. But if you really want to learn how to teach players how to play the game and how to use those drills appropriately, come to our clinics and put it all together. Okay, so on the quality side, we're actually working, um, we're working with Georgia Southern University on a project to, um, to measure and, uh, and look at coach uh, quality. So they're gonna do some recording, some video recordings and analysis of coaches. So it's something that I don't know has ever been done in our space. Um, but it's a wonderful partnership. They're gonna get some opportunities to, to use us as a Petri dish and we've got some potential research coming out of it. So we're excited about that. Um, but this is really about you know, growing engagement and also looking, again, looking for areas that have been untouched. Typically, our, you know, the coaches that come into our sport, unlike, or not unlike other sports, is that they're typically parents of young kids who come in. Some have played, some have not. Um, usually the, the parents are the ones who are asked, well, we can't have a team if you don't coach our, your kid's team. So what do we do now? So we want to be able to try to reach back a little bit farther and work with some folks who already have some of the, the experience. So not just targeting parents, but recent college, college graduates and trying to figure out are there programs that we can work with um, to incentivize uh, college graduates to come and work. Maybe it's a, an internship program where they get connected with a company who is tied to the lacrosse community and part of their, their internship is a requirement to, to coach at a local youth league. So we're looking at different options like that. Um, and obviously the, for us the, the diversity and inclusion piece is, is big. Uh, we're working more with the Sankofa initiative um, and some other diversity groups. Um, this is really kind of to wrap things up in a bow, um, and there are just some things on here that I'll touch on, but really where we are now, again, looking backwards to look forward is uh, our group is getting together to really look ahead, not just you know, one year, three years, but long term, and look at what could our certification and training program look like and how can we make it the best? And let's shoot for the stars and figure out how do we get more coaches 
wanting to come in and not feeling like it's a burden. And that's really, I think, the, the message in building your programming is you have to make it inviting. Um, and all of the things that we've done over the last five, five years have really been just that, focusing on youth learning, focusing on adult uh, learning and development, and finding out ways to make it enjoyable and accessible. So whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's availability, all of those things um, are key in building that program. Because if you're missing one piece, somewhere along the line, it's going to be that, that button that turns off a, a prospective coach to join your program or to, to want to learn. So part of this, this roadmap development is looking at things like college course development. So when you look at a college catalog, it's choose your own adventure, um, you know, especially uh, in, in elective programs. So people who work for a living, when, you know, if you get a local community college flyer, you can take courses in guitar, in music, in art, in painting, in auto mechanics and things like that. But we want to be able to do is, is drive the, the important pieces of the programming. So it's the, the fundamentals. We want to make sure that those are key. But we also want to be able to offer things that are not always available to, to the average coach. So to work with universities like TJ has done, to bring in people in um, health and fitness, in sports psychology, in, in areas of interest to coaches that they might not have access to otherwise. Uh, again, at, uh, with reducing the, the, bar excuse me, the barriers to entry. Um, so some of the things that we're doing to get to that point uh, is really some of the things that I showed you before, but really about um, rebranding who we are and what we offer. You know, beyond just you know, what are we to coaches other than insurance and a magazine. You know, we really need to rebrand and tell our story about what we have to offer to the, uh, to the coaches. Um, our e-learning platform has been developed um, consistently improving every year. Uh, Daniel Whiteman, who we brought on a year and a half ago, has, has done tremendous work. Uh, and we're actually relaunching our Level 1 Fundamentals course. Uh, actually, we're soft launching it next week, but it'll be available on the 28th, wide, uh, basically worldwide. So we can talk about that some more. But really, this is all, again, um, and this is kind of a, it's a little ugly map right now to see. but. Uh, but what we envision is really two pathways. So there's a participation pathway and a performance pathway. And we've never really had this high performance side. Um, again, this is really aligned with, with all the work that TJ is, has done on the athlete development side is to really, we do really well in this space. On the participation side, it's fabulous. Um, where we get challenged is what happens when those coaches who have been coaching for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, or those who think that they are beyond just learning some of the, these basics, how do we get them to come into the fold? And it's not by saying you have to be certified. It's about saying, what do you want to learn? What do you want to know? And what can we offer you? What can we develop that's, that may not be out there? So those are the things that we want to start to build. But essentially, you know, looking at even to the most basic level, uh, the community coach. So how do we get somebody to come in to the pipeline at either a zero cost or a, a very small cost that this is the coach that has been asked to coach a team that has never coached lacrosse, maybe has never played it or never seen it. So what can we do to provide them with support to get them on the field to make sure that their kids are out there having fun and they're safe? And that could be something as simple as going to the online course, understanding the fundamentals, but also taking things like our cultural competency course, the Positive Coaching Alliance course, and, and uh, the concussion course. So some basic information that, again, is really geared around two things. It's about the kids having fun and about keeping them safe. So we feel like that in and of itself can be a really good entry point for the new coach without saying you have to be certified. And then obviously as they develop, we wanna be able to support them and say, where do you wanna go next? If you're done, that's great. If you're interested in other things, what can we offer to support you? Um, 
And then obviously as we drive through our development stages, um, going into this performance and ultimately driving the coach development into a space where um, coaches who want to have their players ultimately get into our uh, national team development pipeline, they have the resources to be able to, to teach at that level. Not saying that they don't now, but if it is, we need you, you need to be teaching things the US lacrosse way. Um, and that, that ultimately is driven by the national team coaches um, along with the, the staff as we develop it. It doesn't exist right now, but again, what we're trying to figure out is what can we develop that's gonna take us into, you know, trying to think where we are right now, where 20, sometimes you lose track of days, but it, you know, into the, next, into the next 20 years. Because I think, again, if, if I go back and, and when I say lessons learned and tables turn, how do, I, how do I talk to myself 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, and go, you know what, you made the right decision by planning this far out, okay? Because that's the, the, the conversation we wanna have. That's where we win. Okay? And really that's, um, again, to that message that says, you know, if you build it, they will come, but you have to do it smart and you have to be able to be willing to, to step out of your comfort zone and say, where do we really want this to be? Um, and the biggest thing that you have to have is the patience because uh, uh, perfect example. So today we had our, our level two clinic. Uh, we launched our new material. We had a separate group with our trainers and we had a little conversation afterwards. And I said, you know, what else is on your mind? And the trainers came back and said, well, you know what? We would love to have more information, more videos and more clinics to, to teach on substitution and goalie play and face-offs. And, and I'm going, you know what? I would love to have those too. So it's, so now it's, how do we take that? Because we know this is, if this is what people want, then we should be able to give it to them. So the question is, how do we give it to them in a way that, that matches our program, in a way that's inexpensive, that's accessible, and it will keep us going, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the line. So um, there's no magic bullet for developing the program. Um, my wish to the, the FIL member countries is that you kind of take the, the lessons that we've learned and, and the modifications that we've made over the last 10, 15 years and, and take those and learn from them and go forth and, and be brilliant. So Excellent. what questions can I answer? Actually, uh, Kevin, uh, thank you for the great presentation. And, um, and a big part of your message is the forward thinking and the planning ahead. Uh, it, this question is going to ask you to go back a little bit. Okay. And uh, what advice could, would you give to the FIL that is now help, trying to help emerging countries trying to get, not necessarily here, but just get started uh, with training, uh, training trainers and then training coaches to be coaches? Because that's really where the void is uh, yeah. for the FIL for the emerging countries. Wow. Um. Can I phone a friend in the audience as well? So, <laughs> now, what's it, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a magic formula, but I think it, it's several things. It's identifying, and I think this is one of the big keys, is, is identifying the right people in the country that have, that share the philosophy. Um, again, the conversation I had with our trainers today was, um, was challenging them. And I said, you know, if you believe this material and you buy in, then that's great. If you don't, then you probably shouldn't be teaching our content. And that is something I don't think you can, um, anyone can really afford to, um, to have on board people who don't truly believe in the philosophy. So just like in, in coaching, if you develop your philosophy and you develop your culture first and foremost and say this is what our program sh is going to be built on long term, I think that's first and foremost. I think you find those people who believe that and truly have a passion for it, 
I think you also need to look at people who are educators. So I tell people all the time, you know, teaching, coaching, it, I, don't, I, I say it a little flippantly, but it's not about lacrosse. It's about can you connect with the learner? Um, you know, as, as John Wooden used to say, you know, they haven't learned, you haven't taught until they've learned, right? So uh, people who understand the educational aspects, who understand the, the fundamental principles of long-term athlete development, about cognitive development, I know it's a tough, it's a tough balance uh, because the people who are passionate about growing the game are lacrosse people. And I personally, I, you know, I have a marketing background and spent 30 years in the, in the corporate world and have re, kind of revised or, or renewed my, my passion about things because of, again, the work that TJ and his team have done and, and taking on learning and development. Um, it can be learned. Uh, having somebody who has that educational background is key. Obviously, the cross back, lacrosse background is key as well. So, that identifying those those trainers um, who have the availability and the willingness um, is key. Again, to, to use that core, that culture, and that that philosophy as your core, and you can't you can't waver from it. First of all, Kevin, to uh, congratulate you, U.S. Lacrosse, uh, just. The last four years is uh, outstanding growth. Number of instructors, number of coaches. Team. Amazing. Team. You know, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I take it from your presentation that it's it's not mandatory for a coach. It's a um, it's an optional thing. It, was that was that a conscious decision, or was that something you just didn't want to tackle mandatory? Sure. For certification specifically. For certification, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question. So, this is the this is really the tough part about being a governing body that can't really govern because we're a membership-based organization. Um, but here's the key, and we have amazing uh, local program leaders around the country who basically, they are the ones who set the standard, who say, if you are gonna coach for us, then you need to be certified. Uh, we, we don't have any recourse against somebody for not being certified. Uh, so for us, the, the real challenge is, is making it desirable more than anything. So, so some, some chapters do make it mandatory? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess a follow-up question would be, you know, I understand that, you know, some courses can be theory courses that are generic. Right. Good information, doesn't matter what sport. Um, technically, do you have a, a indoor-specific course? And if not, do you plan on having a indoor box course? Sure. That's a great question. Thanks for asking. That's two good questions. Right. These are easy ones compared to Dino's. <laughs> so, uh, to which I do not have an answer for you. So um, obviously as we rebuild our, our roadmap, box is going to be an integral part of that. Um, right now, um, you know, our primary focus is on serving our current constituents, which are 99% plus you know, outdoor field players. Um, but again, this is where the challenge comes in that we have to look beyond ourselves. And box is gonna be a huge part. You can tell just by this convention alone how many tracks we've added. So, um, and, and you know, the challenge there is finding the best people to do that. And we've got a, uh, you know, a great partnership with the NLL. So I think the resources, you know, Reggie Thorpe and his group are, we have them. We just need to figure out how they're going to play in. First and foremost, I want to thank you and U.S. Lacrosse for making those uh, online courses, coaches' courses available to FIL members. I mean, that was big. And uh, um, for those of, uh, of our members that are not aware of it, and they should be, right, right, Bobby? Uh, those courses are made available uh, through U.S. Lacrosse. I have a question. Uh, outside the Northeast and on the West Coast Seattle, what's your fastest growing demand for those uh, um, courses? Wow. For the in-person clinics? Specifically? Yes, the clinics. Um, I have to think about where we're putting a lot of our effort. Um, Ohio, there's a big influx there. Uh, the desire is the desire is coming from everywhere. Uh, the challenge is where we have the resources to support that. Um, the middle of the country in, in Texas is growing. The, the challenge, to be very honest, is the desire's there, the resources 
are available through US Across. The challenge is having the right local hosts who can actually pull the clinics off. Um, that doesn't fully answer your question, but I wanted to say that because I think it's important for you know, member countries who you need to balance the desire with the, um, the resources, but also can, these, can the people who want them actually pull them off. Um, so uh, Northern California is, is an enormous uh, growth area. Um, and, and what's driving that, to be honest, is the, the league uh, and their director. Um, so that, that's really all it takes is somebody who can do that. But, um, so the desire is strong in Florida, Ohio, Texas, the actual work that's being done to make it happen is really being done in, in Northern California, out, you know, outside of the Seattle area. Um, Bob and I and several people in here give clinics all over the world, and what you, what you see as uh, prior to going to a country to give a clinic and what happens when you're on the ground, uh, there are certain obstacles that you have to be very flexible with. Do you face certain obstacles once you put a trainer on the ground uh, that not getting what they thought they were getting into? <laughs> yeah, so Joanna's next, right? Yeah, I, I know I could ask her. She has a million stories. I, so she, well, she's done one in a horse barn, <laughs> yeah. uh, true horse barn. But yes, uh, uh, you know, and when, again, f from a logistics standpoint, that is the toughest thing because, again, it's that desire. Somebody wants a clinic so bad, and they got the date, and they've got the coaches. Please, please come, and we show up, uh, and we ask for. So I was down in Florida three, four weeks ago, and you know, it rains in Florida. And we said we'd like, you know, we need to have an indoor backup space. And we get down there, and it's absolutely torrentially raining. And you know, the the guys who who put on the clinic said, well, you know, we're all football coaches. We'll, we'll go out and play. And I said, you don't understand. We can't do this because learning doesn't happen when people are uncomfortable. So I said, you know what? We're going to wait. And if it stops raining, we'll put it on. If not, we're going to have to come up with a backup plan. But their backup plan was. A, uh, a baseball announcing booth, which was a third of the size of this room for 20 coaches. Mm -hmm. So, and at that point, you know, we couldn't, but we've done things, I mean, TJ's been there, we've done them in cafeteria hallways, we've done them in parking lots. Um, there's a great saying by Duke Whalen, one of our trainers in North Carolina, is adjust we must. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we get our coaches trained. Well, I've seen Joanna and Jane in similar situations where it's pouring and they went inside in a facility where we weren't allowed to use lacrosse balls okay. and basketballs came out and uh, shuttlecocks for badminton. God, and they, uh, it was quite impressive. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, that's a really, it's a great question. It's really interesting because, again, you know, if we're talking, and, and I wanted to frame this in terms of, of what's outside of the United States, you know, if, if I've heard stories about, you know, you and your group when you go places and sticks don't show up or you're in a field of some sort that has no grass. This game is, is amazing because you can teach the concepts, you can teach it in this room, um, as long as people come in with an open mind and a willingness to, to, to understand it. You don't need lines on a field, you know. Um, our entire level two program, developing the team player, we don't use sticks at all. We use little soccer balls. Um, so. Well, th thank you. Kevin, great job. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. I appreciate it. Just a small token of our appreciation for your coming. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. This is, this is, oh, we got to get a photo. Oh. So get a photo. Yeah, like I said, this is new and first for us, so. This is fantastic. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> this is athlete development.